I'm Lori Bell, and I'm a lecturer at uh, the School of Library and Information Science at San Jose State University. And on behalf of my colleague, uh, Bill Fisher, and our technical coordinator, Randy Chang, I'd like to welcome you uh, to the, the Spring Colloquium Series. And we're so pleased and excited um, to have Joe Murphy here with us. And Joe, we've had a lot of excitement around your, your being here for uh, this colloquium. I'll tell you a little bit about Joe, and then he can tell you more uh, when I turn the microphone over to him. Um, Joe is a former science librarian at Yale University. Um, he's now a librarian and technology uh, trend spotter consultant. He, um, got his uh, MLS at University of Hawaii, and he's written numerous uh, articles, um, is working on several books, speaks at uh, numerous conferences, uh, organizes numerous conferences, and I told him that his resume looks like he should be about 50 years old because he has so many accomplishments. But Joe, we're so pleased to have you um, here today talking about uh, the technologies impacting libraries and publishing in 2012. So thank you for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And luckily for me, it's only my resume that looks like it's 50, and I'm not quite there yet, but uh, I'm certainly getting close. So this is a really fun opportunity to me. I'm probably... Uh, even more excited than you guys are because it's a great time to be chatting about this topic. There's a lot going on. This has been a really hot couple months already in 2012 for technology, and I think we'll have some good discussion. So make sure that you are thinking about questions and, and having a really critical mind when you, when you hear my talk so that when we come to the question section, you can add to the discourse. Now, even though we're going to be talking about technology, the most important thing is how we ourselves as a profession are dealing with this. And so remember that whether it's within your group, within our larger profession, that we are the most powerful resource we have for engaging this. So as this quote here that I found on a recent Yogi Tea Bag says, together we can do what we can never do alone. There's fabulous things that as a profession we can accomplish and can overcome if we work together. So let's make sure that we are a powerful, cohesive, personal learning network and that we continue to grow as that unit. One of the interesting statistics that came out pretty recently that I thought was really, uh, really powerful to set the stage was how much has changed the demographics of smartphone usage. This Nielsen study showed that now actually 62% of people who have a mobile device between the age of 25 and 35 actually have a smartphone. Just two years ago that was about half that. And the reason this is so important is because the digital divide is shifting so dramatically and so quickly towards having de devices that enable enhanced interaction with information and with each other. Very different from the universal penetration of, of cell phones, this is now allowing us to have a heightened engagement with higher levels of information. I took this picture at a uh, local art park. I thought this, this exhibit was really interesting. It was, uh, it was a combination of nature, books, and, and fake books to produce art in the eye with this really interesting idea of showing the value, the continued value of print across different media. And I love this Shakespeare quote here as well, that the, these trees shall be my books, We're making sure to uh, remind us of where we're coming from and what values we need to, uh, to keep in place as so much else changes. And you guys probably saw in the Oscars the other night that the fantastic flying books of Mr. Morris Lessmore won for short film of the year. And I've discovered that not only is there a not only is the, the video itself fabulous and worth the purchase on the iTunes store, but there's a great app that goes along with it that you should really check out. It's one of the best examples of an interactive e-storybook app. And it's, uh, it's not free, but it's definitely worth downloading. It's a great example of how to create 
a book experience that combines the multimedia capabilities of the iPad. So check it out, download it, and really enjoy the story and share it with your Patreon groups. One of the biggest pieces of news in the publishing industry so far this year has been Apple's release of iAuthor, which is their way to help Mac and Apple users become self-published authors. Now we know that self-publishing has been a huge theme for a couple of years now. In fact, some of the best sellers on Amazon this year have been self-published authors. And what iAuthor does is allow you to not just create your own electronic book, but to create it in a way that is geared directly for the iPad so it can maximize those multimedia and touch functionalities. And you do need a Mac, but you can really simply enter the text and then enter the interactive features, and you can sell it directly in the iBook store. So this is really cool because it gives so many more people the ability to do this. It changes the reliance upon traditional publishers, but it also challenges libraries as content providers trying to figure out exactly how we can continue to fit in as facilitators and engagers of content as things like this disrupt the traditional framework. And there's tons of news about digital content coming out every day. Just the other day, uh, a major publisher of graphic novels announced that they were finally going to be available through the iBook store. And this is cool because even though there's been some great mobile electronic graphic novels in the past, never have they really been able to powerfully engage the full features of our devices. This is a great example. And looking at some other big trends for mobile e-content would include the personalization and interactivity of content. This is one example of a company that not only allows you to self-publish, but to really create an, inter an interactive experience geared towards children. There's a lot of that going on, and this is just one of many examples. And of course, the biggest story in digital content over the last couple of years, actually, has been the uh, the mobile application Flipboard. Now Flipboard was originally created just for the iPad with the idea of being able to maximize the features of the iPad, including its touch screen, ability to have interactive and, and multiple types of media, but really the success was that it was social. It allowed you to personally curate the inflow of information. You could choose from social networks, from streamed websites, and now from proprietary subscription-based content points. But also it's visual. You don't just see page after page, you discover and you consume based on their images. The big story a couple months ago was that they also released an iPhone application. And within the first week of it being out, it was downloaded over a million times. So we know that this has made Flipboard go from huge success in the three to four million range to now um, closer to the five to six million range. And its success, though, can be measured in bigger things than just user base. We see that the number of competitors has sprung up across the board, and some of them are being consumed by larger media industries, including what its competitor site, which was bought by CNN a while ago, showing that they recognize the importance of this trend as they continue to figure out how to display and provide content for their users. We also see more and more opportunities or attempts to bridge the digital and physical book experience, whether it's in-store like this with the mobile enhancement. And we also see that as the major trends this year tend to blur and combine, we have more and more opportunities to socialize the services that we're engaging. One of my favorite examples is Instagram, the biggest of the mobile photo sharing applications, which has huge power for everyone, including content providers. There's some really cool news organizations like NPR that use Instagram fabulously to add an image element to their stories, but also to more importantly, create an opportunity to expand in a social sphere exposure to their content. It's real. If you're not familiar with Instagram, make sure you give it a try. It is, in fact, only for iOS, and they've had fabulous success for that. And they said they'll expand to Android, but apparently that's not the most important priority for them. They also do not have a web version, proving that they can be fully successful, not just going mobile first, but mobile only. And there's great uses for Instagram for libraries. I included a chapter about Instagram uh, book I recently published about location-aware technologies, showing that there's many, many projects you can use Instagram to apply to enhance 
your users' engagement with the library itself by allowing them to add to the visual narrative for your building or for your services. The best ways to do this are actually to use the location of your library and the location features of Instagram to bring together all images taken at that location. In a way, creating an ongoing and organic visual representation of your spaces and services. But you can also do this through hashtags. Instagram allows hashtags so you can bring together images of similar topics. And you can use this if you're in a public library and you have a book club. You can bring together all images about that book or about what the book is about. If you're at an academic library, you can bring together anything about a certain research project. Or you can use Instagram's API to bring together all images taken within a certain distance. So anything taken in your town, in your campus, or in your community, and then host that in an online exhibit, whether it's simply on a web page or on a screen in your library, or to be printed off as a QR code that can link back to it to continue to drive the cycle of engagement. Instagram is not the only one, but it is absolutely the largest mobile photo sharing application. An early competitor path, which was so outpaced by Instagram that it was forgotten, released an update a couple months ago that really put it back in the spotlight. And what, it, what Path did with this update is actually make it a viable live streaming application, not just photo sharing. So as you see on the bottom left, you have many more opportunities than simply posting an image. You can check in with a person. You can check in at a location. You can check into a song as digital content, share your thoughts, or even have it automatically share your location. And since Path is based on the priority of privatization of your being able to maintain who has access to this information, you can more securely and comfortably overshare. And on the right hand side, you see a couple examples of things I've done checking into places and checking in with songs by adding an Ill image or a location element. So they've combined the idea of sharing pictures, sharing images, and sharing things about your life while overlapping each of those aspects in a really successful way. So if you haven't tried Path, Check it out. This one is cross-platform. And if you're wondering if there's any actual usage for a library, think about the power you could have if you could harness each of the 100 connections you're allowed to have with highly engaged members of your community, being able to really give them rewards for interacting with your social and virtual representations. Another really interesting app that started to get big at the beginning of this year was Oink. Really uh, simply named and, and simply and simple to use, Oink app allows you to, as their byline says, rate the real world things in the real world places you like to go. So they take the location check-in a little bit further by allowing you to, again, add an image in that location, but check-in also to an item found at that location. So this person in this example checked into this piece of cheesecake, was able to add a bit of kind of, of an annotation reward or put it on their to-do list so they can put it as a location-sensitive reminder for the future. The real power with Oink for libraries is you could be able to interact and rate and review books within a library or services. The only problem with Oink is it didn't take off quite as much as we thought it would. I think it's one of the best examples for what engagement with mobile devices at physical locations will look like this year. And even if Oink itself doesn't continue to succeed, take a look at it as an example for the powers and possibilities. And of course, the biggest news this week is that next week on March 7th, iPad 3 is going to be released. We don't know for absolute certain what it's going to include, but definitely watch this. This is one of the most important things to watch because Apple, as now the world's largest company, does more to set the stage for technological innovation and trends than any other entity in the world. This was exampled in the last iOS update over the fall when each of the changes they made to their software reflected perfectly the major trends of last year, of location interaction, of photo manipulation and sharing, of being able to interact and cross your content across devices with iCloud. So watch very carefully what happens on March 7th. In other Apple news, the amount of apps sold across iOS devices is rapidly approaching 25 billion. That's right. You can see their countdown online. It's very close right now, and it's absolutely amazing that they've been able to hit this. And it's really fun to watch how quickly this counter moves, not just in the singles and hundreds and thousands, but in the millions. You can see them fly by. And they're going to offer a pretty big prize for it. And it'll be probably later today, because I think right now they're closer to 
$24,859,000,000. So watch for that and continue to engage those apps. And there's been some really interesting developments extremely recently about engagement with all types of social media. One of those huge stars, of course, has been Pinterest, which we see from this infographic from the Wall Street Journal online is in attach or engaging as much of our attention as Tumblr and more than everything else except the monstrosity of Facebook still. So this says that you actually are spending, or the average user is spending about 89 minutes Now, Pinterest is a favorite uh, new technology of mine. Of course, it's not actually new. It's been around for almost two years, but as far as its massive success, you can think about it in quite recent terms. Now, if you have not tried Pinterest, the only way to really understand the huge attention it's getting is to play with it yourself, and you will learn exactly why they call it addictive. I wrote a blog post about Pinterest and its information applications and library settings a couple months ago, and you can check it out at that URL if you want some idea about what the library potentialities are, but think about it in, in this framework, that the real important thing is it allows you to leverage the biggest trends in discovery and sharing of image-based discovery and collaborative and self-curation of content. So think about that if you're wondering why libraries would be interested in this. It's important because it allows you to, as a group or as a person, content the data you find online through its image representations. If you want to use it in your library, think about simply using it as a visual bookmark tool, replacing some of the old traditional URL bookmarkers. Or you can share images of the new books that come in, just as you probably already share information about or through a stream or RSS of new books. You can also open up to contributions from community, whether you're pinning images that have been put online by your community or you're creating collaborative pin boards to allow them to engage. It's a great visual resource guide to replace or complement subject guides. You can actually encourage and facilitate and teach in the use of this tool as a collaboration tool or use it among staff to add a human element. And there's great ways you can track elements or you can track metrics in it as well. And instead of thinking of it as yet another new thing to do, think of it as a complement of your existing social media campaigns that can mesh really well with each of them. For uh, a lot more detail, I'm going to give some upcoming webcasts about Pinterest. I can dive deep into the application scenarios, the projects, exactly what the challenges are, et cetera. So feel free to register for those if you want more information. It's a really fun topic. And then, of course, there's near field communication, which has been growing for a couple of years, and we've been hearing about it and not really seeing its mass adoption that we've been expecting, but I think that's still around the corner. Now, near field communication, if you're not familiar with it, is simply the ability to transfer a bit of information over very small distances. It's like RFID, but only within 10 centimeters or less. And on this piece of artwork, if you see this little blue dot in the corner of this, the base of it, that's actually a near field communication tag, or if you tap your phone against that, it'll transfer to your phone information about the exhibit in the form of a URL or a short blurb, telling you everything you need to know without having to necessarily take extra steps as you would, for instance, with a QR code of having to engage the visual element and translate that. But it doesn't mean that QR codes themselves are passe. In fact, I think QR codes will continue to be relevant at least within the framework of a couple major considerations. And those considerations are this. As long as there's a need to be able to engage digital information associated with a real world place and you want to be able to have your phone as a bridge to that, near, uh, Near-field communication and QR codes will have a role, and QR codes will continue to dominate as long as smartphones continue to have an emphasis on the visual consumption and translation of that information. Now, it's been used quite widely, and you've probably already heard of it or encountered it. On the left is a brochure that a local library used to help. And on the right, you, this was a bookstore that used a QR code in not the best manner. When I scanned this, I saw that I was actually the first person to scan it, and it wasn't what I expected. It was simply a traditional version of the web page. So think about what the real applications are and don't just jump into it. Their major strength is being able to create hyperlinks out of traditional libraries. 
and gaming is huge across every demographic and application. My favorite example of gaming libraries was last year's Find the Future program at the New York Public Library. Check out their website for more information. But what's important here is that they were able to gamify attention and interaction with objects in the library by helping people or by encouraging people to find things and write about them and then bringing together all of those writings into one publication. Here's information about that book I wrote about location-aware services. And the reason I'm showing you this is because the biggest technology trend over the last year that's continuing to this year has been the ability to interact with physical places by their virtual representations across things like location-based services, including Foursquare, QR codes, augmented reality. So for more details, check out that book. But one of my one of the best things I think that Foursquare has done recently is add the partnership of having menus available at, at venues. So if you check into or look into a Foursquare venue it's a restaurant, it may be associated with its menu information and that can help you beyond just the social reviews to decide what to do, where to go and what to do there. Some of the other major things they did is tie in very well the last I.O iOS 5 software update, which used both the, their radar feature and the notification feature to encourage you to engage locations that you're nearby, t taking us a step closer to the automatic engagement with the places. And of course, their badges are still really popular forms of engagement. And if you check into the libraries, it'll tell you you have a crush on their librarian. It's probably true anyways. Augmented reality continues to grow. It has really great applications for libraries. Just think about the reason this is important for us is because the way that people are discovering information is happening more and more at that point of information. So in the real world, let's make sure the libraries are included within that. Now the, the social entertainment check-in suite of applications that was huge last year continue to be big. Miso is not as popular anymore as Get Glue, but it's a really good example here of how to engage it. Get Glue has continued to have great success. You see in the tweet in the middle of this picture here that they had a, a record-breaking day with uh, over 150,000 people checking into the Super Bowl. The Oscars did really well as well. As you see on the left, over 19,000 people liked it within GetClue and 130,000 people checked in. So the reason this is important is because there's online or interactive content, whether it's through books, movies, television, or whatever, that people are enhancing their engagement with. So they're interacting with it. They're, uh, they're able to leverage and deepen their, their uh, attention with it. So ad advertisers love this, producers love this, and consumers love this. Into Now is another interesting one. It actually kind of like Shazam listens to what you're watching to, and tells you. And of course, there's big things going on in, in every sector that continue to be big at the end of last year that have the companies that have decided to adapt, like sound tracking and food spotting have added some really interesting updates. So they're still relevant in there and they are serve as good examples. I want to mention that mobile payments continue to be huge and this will be a big year for them. It was last year that Google released its Google Wallets program allowing you to use near field communication for mobile payments. It's really a great program, but it has a lot of uh, it has a lot of catching up to do if it wants to meet the expectations it's set. But there's easy ways you can apply things like Google Wallet in your library. Check out their website for how you can, for what vendor you can work with to grab a, uh, a reader so that people can play fines, et cetera, for your library. And think about the applications for the future. Also think about being able to do something that may be just as simple but offer broad opportunities like using the Square application for taking those fines or advanced interactions. Google Plus continues to grow but also it continues to be challenged. Now even though actually now they have over 100 million users, it's shown that people spend such little time on Google Plus that it's, uh, it's almost negligible compared to the other major social networks. Even things like Pinterest, which drive more traffic than Google Plus and YouTube and LinkedIn combined. Google Plus has fabulous opportunities for libraries though, and I encourage you to play with it and think about what those are, what it can mean for service roles, for the opportunities in reference and circulation, the opportunities for liaising to different groups. And if you want some ideas, there's been some really uh, cool blog post in the bottom right is a URL to something I wrote a while ago. David the King had a great blog post about it, but you should try to play with it and think, and think with your own creativity what the applications mean. But even though there's a lot of naysayers, it is big, it does have a major impact, and it does have a lot of power. And it's expected within a year to have as many users 
as twice what Twitter has now and half of what Facebook has. So it's not something to ignore. There is still lots of room to have an emphasis on SMS, and there are more and more companies that are making it easy to integrate that within education. And the idea of focusing on mobile communication but across platforms has been really big. And the focus, though, that I think is to leverage the existing mobile communication platforms that have already con and continue to be successful, like Facebook Messenger and iMessage. LinkedIn announced the other day that they, you can now add follow buttons to your website. So if your library or a similar institution or a partnering institution is using LinkedIn, it's a great way to take advantage. This infographic from InMobi really impressed me, showing that amongst the time that, that people are using the mobile web, 27% of that time is being done with, uh, or is being done with devices, which is, um, yeah, I said that wrong. The average mobile, mobile user actually uses mobile device 27% of the time as compared to their 22% of the time that they engage television or only, but it's still dwarfed by their engagement from uh, PCs. Really interesting to watch how that's changing. And there's so much emphasis on technology in the mobile sphere, and we try not to only talk about that, but I wanted to uh, use a bit of humor like with this pin I found on Pinterest to show that we don't want to overemphasize the engagement with mobile even though the statistics show that that's the fastest growing segment. And, but there's also really many important and interesting things like 3D printing. This is a picture I took at the Fayetteville Free Library of their 3D printer and it's pretty little and easy to use and why it's important is it opens up the creative process to their community. So they're able to allow people themselves to create what they need. So we've packed in a lot here, and now we're going to have some time for questions. And if you don't have questions you want to ask today, feel free to be in touch with me here. But let's do encourage some discussion now, and if there's not enough, we can go back to some things I skipped over. Joe, there's a question here in the chat from Carol um, who asked about copyright concerns with uh, Pinterest. All right, that's a fun question. The, it, as anything that allows you to share things discovered online, there are in fact concerns that people have to have fail saves or mechanisms for making sure that their intellectual property is protected within Pinterest. Now, I know several people who have already had problems. I know an artist whose pictures have been pinned with, without attribution, etc. It's just like the things we faced in Twitter and Facebook. We know that people have to have the same level of of expectations for respecting copyright as they do in other fields, but they need to have the skills for it, and that'll fall to libraries to be able to teach those skills. Whenever you pin something, for instance, the link is already maintained unless you change it, and so is the, the associated information. So if you pin something that was originally, or you were the first person to put it on Pinterest, make sure you're giving proper attribution. And if not, make sure you give attribution to that tree of discovery as well. There's also tools that allow you to block people pinning from your site, but the reverse side of this is it's going to happen anyway, so make sure it happens as well as possible. Make sure that your websites are optimized for Pinterest by including all of the relevant information, that they include pictures, first of all, and that when you have the opportunity in creating the website, you put in the information and attribution information within those files. Okay, Joe, we have a question about what is the tree of discovery? Well, that, that's just a term used to discover that the process at which the pin or whatever it may be has arrived at, at you. So just like with Twitter, the first person you've read something from may not have been the originator of that, so you may want to say discovered via this person but originally published by this person. But when you repin re something, it'll originally it'll tell you where you repin it from, but it may not automatically give that full tree of information about where it came from. So make sure you give attribution as it's needed, even if that has to be manual, and include that in your suite of skills when teaching people how to effectively and efficiently and ethically use it. Okay, another question, what about affiliate links on Pinterest? Um, she heard that they uh, charge it or change it so they get affiliate credit. Well, if you're worried at all about where the links go, you have the opportunity to edit the, the URL within a pin. And if you want to put that, for instance, to something that is only under your control or, more importantly, a short URL whose metrics you want to track, that's an answer to that. Here's another question. Um, what are your thoughts as far about, as federated, question search about federated search engines? Well, it, it's an important question. It, it's been a huge trend for years. 
you're you're going to be disappointed to hear that I don't have any great recommendations, but it's it's a uh, it's going to continue to be important. The emphasis on single subject or single activity search engines will continue to dwindle into obscurity. So make sure that you're familiar with them and helping your patrons be. But also when thinking about web services, make sure that you're not relegating the rich online resources associated with your library to one-off databases. Okay, here's a couple good ones, um, Joe. Uh, Fundraising for projects like films and CDs, and how do you uh, keep on top of all the technology coming out? Those are indeed good questions. There's lots of opportunities for fundraising. If I can try to tie this in as close as possible, one of the best opportunities may be the, uh, the ability to use things like Kickstarter, a social fundraising project where you can post an advertisement for, that you need funds for something. People will vote and organically contribute to your product if they see it worthwhile. That's been actually the, the, the genesis of many really interesting and large-scale projects, so check that out. Also, there's lots of opportunities with using these new technologies. You can use QR codes to collect donations, et cetera. And this question of how to keep up on all the technology is really key. It's each of our responsibility to make sure we're current, but it's nothing that any of us can do alone. I have the opportunity to do it because I'm able to focus 100% on that field within my job. That's, that is my job to not only stay current, but to help synthesize across to do to the rest of our profession. So make sure that you have a personal learning network, that you spend time each day reading the news, but also that you appropriately prioritize it. So find ways to, to efficiently stay current, and more importantly, find ways to strategically choose what areas of priority you should make sure you know the most information and where you can allow widespread or general level synthesis. Joe, any other points that you would like to make? Thank you for a great presentation. I think the only remaining the only remaining points I want to emphasize are the importance of taking responsibility for guiding the profession in the direction that you really feel is important, for putting that energy into staying current, and as your career grows, make sure you keep in mind that more important than anything else is the, the spirit and value of the profession. So make sure kindness and, uh, and gratitude may remain one of your priorities. And also, I just want to say thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. It's been no, a lot of fun a, for me. And I think I'll, uh, I'll post a link if to my slides if you guys are trend, interested as well. One trend to learn about, what would you focus on? And then what are your thoughts on how corporate sponsorship uh, might fund new technology in a library? It's hard to identify any one single trend that's important. What I would instead do is take a look at everything coming at us and I'm trying to think about what it means for, for information engagement. Forget about the library at first. Think about things you're hearing about in your own life, whether it's e-readers or tablets or, or location engagement or social media, and think about how they're changing personal behaviors. So just look at your own life or, your, or that of your, your peers or colleagues and think that the trend really that you should be paying attention to is shifting human behaviors as it applies to information. If you're going to look at anything else, think, or anything at all, think about those terms. Um, what was the other question? Oh, yeah, uh, corporate sponsorship. Uh, innovation can be expensive, and it can be a great way to, uh, to be able to open up opportunities. Innovation is expensive in staff time and often in direct resource costs. So it may be a good opportunity. I'm sure that there's a lot of detractors who would say that then you have to uh, worry about the, the undue impact and concern from those corporate sponsors, but they could, those can be really strategic and can be chosen to mutual benefit from the beginning. So that's a great idea. Do whatever you can to keep innovation as a priority because the most important things that we can do in our, our profession are stay relevant and stay current. Everything about libraries is changing so fast. The consumption of books, the format of books, the opportunities for trends are very nature. So the most important capital you have is the ability to stay on top of that. So if you need to look to corporate sponsorship, that's fine. I just read about the uh, programs that you're doing and um, organizing at computers and libraries, and I wish I were going. It sounds great. So. Um, Okay, here's, here's another question. Will Blackboard still be here in 10 years? Uh, <laughs> well, that's a rather complicated question uh, when you look at its partnerships, et cetera. But 
the the importance of having a, an interactive educational platform like that will will continue to actually grow. Any printing technology recommendations for um, iOS, Android, etc. Recommendations, not really. The what I'm what I've been excited about is how much improvements they've made recently. It's really becoming viable to include attachments to your iOS mobile devices within your traditional office technology and be able to have some really good wireless printing. Now, what I would recommend is taking a look at some of these things are actually being reviewed in the popular literature now, as far as uh, um, review sites, etc. So. The important thing to note here is that this is something that, that's finally viable on a large scale. And we see this in things like a recent study that showed that a huge percent of IT professionals are, have the same concepts of control of their staff's devices that they did several years ago, but they also have misconceptions about what our needs and uses are. They think that we have one to two devices and that we're following the rules, but actually we more we more likely have three to four and that we're skirting the rules to be able to do this. So, so many of the examples include guerrilla printing, but there's ways you can bring this officially into your workplace and make sure that when you look for examples and recommendations, you're able to keep an eye on what the, what the real staff needs for the very short-term future will be and not as what your staff is saying they like to do now. Blogs like. that you would recommend following? Yeah, that's a great question. The, uh, the news resource Mashable, which is actually the biggest technology and entertainment news outlet on, on the web, is a fabulous way to keep current on technology and social media news. I always recommend that and it's, it never disappoints. It's at a, a, a level that's approachable to everyone. I'd also recommend things like TechCrunch and the Wall Street Journal's Digits blog. There's some really great technology podcasts out there as well. And even the technology sections of the major newspapers can be really useful. In my daily routine, I make sure to read all of the above plus more. Find a couple good ones to, to read a couple times a week, and I think that'll really do the trick, although the best solution is to just pay close attention to your, uh, your professional community on social media so you can see what's being filtered through them that's, that's proving to be useful so that you can stay current. Do you see e-readers or monitors attached to a server as a bigger part of the future of libraries? Oh, and is technology changing so fast that a tech plane is outdated uh, before it can be implemented? Well, for, for the second question, yeah, because the, 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 emph the rate of change is increasing, but the plan will only be outdated if you don't plan ahead for that change. So the, uh, every time you're making a strategic plan for engaging with technology at your workplace, it has to include Ad adaptability for the future. So don't plan for just one specific technology unless you know that specific technology has flexibility for what upcoming trends may emerge. Instead of e-readers, think about um, about emerging devices. We we know that the uh, we, we've seen much more power come from the the Kindle Fire and, and the Nook tablet than their e-reading uh, uh, predecessors. And but still, the most impactful has been the iPad. So. We, we see that over the Christmas season, for instance, the amount of, uh, of e-readers or e-reading devices, which includes tablets, actually literally doubled in America in just one month. So it's going to absolutely impact everything that libraries do. But at the same time, Apple's iPads have had a record quarter. Apple itself had a record quarter because of selling the iPhone 4S and, the, and their continued selling of iPads. So think about what multi-purpose tablet devices will be doing and changing to impact things and how the reading experience continues to evolve with that. Joe, thank you so much. You've done a great job. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And if you have further questions for Joe you think of later, his email is, is on the slide there. Thank you all. I really appreciate the opportunity. Have a great day and weekend.